Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, just uh, just uh, want to uh, say that um, you know, as I'm reading through the scriptures, I try to read through the scriptures regularly um, every year, and uh, I always what I see is these themes that kind of the Holy Spirit reveals to me. Uh, you know, a, a theme of discipleship, themes of of uh, just uh, how the Lord works in individual lives, uh, just the, the the theme of of how really the the cross is kind of central in just about every book. Uh, Jesus Himself as well, and so the, the, these different themes that the Holy Spirit brings to mind uh, in reference to, in, in the Word that sometimes you really can't see unless you're you're kind of have a, a, an idea of the big picture. And one of the themes that the Holy Spirit has been kind of uh, revealing to me through the scriptures as I'm reading through it is how much the Bible speaks specifically to men and how God really his redemptive process is always linked to a specific man and that how, how men really are the, the conduit of God's working in, in the life of a family, in the life of a, of a nation, in the life of a church. And so it's something that really kind of I was asking the Lord, well, what should I speak about? And the last time I spoke, I think it was about a year ago in February. And um, it was uh, the thing was uh, of David and how the Lord kind of got his attention away from uh, not necessarily just building this temple for God, but to his future uh, generations. And so he got him to look beyond his his present time and lifetime, if you will, to beyond uh, his life to his future generations, to the future of Israel, to the future of ultimately this Messiah that will come through his line. And so it, it's a thing where God is is looking to get us in into in our minds beyond uh, our own limited vision. And so it's it's a thing where uh, God is always looking to to move us beyond this this temporal idea. And how he does that is through through men, through uh, through individuals. So we're we're going to be looking at the letter of First John because uh, I always find it uh, interesting that that uh, there's a specific group that First John speaks about here in chapter two speaks to, and uh, he speaks specifically to children. He speaks specifically to uh, to fathers and to young men, and uh, and and he's basically focusing on the leadership of uh, this church or these churches that he's writing to specifically these believing churches and so we're going to be looking at the letter of first john chapter 2 verse uh, 12 to 14. and like i said it's three specific uh, groups and so this theme that that god speaks through men is is very evident in the bible in the old testament and let, let's just uh, begin uh, with the with a, with a word of prayer and then we'll get into it Again, Father, thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather together in your name. Lord, if it wasn't for, for Jesus, uh, none of this would be uh, possible. Even me standing here, we know that it's only by your power, by your spirit, Lord. And, and that's what we're asking, that you would uh, reveal yourself. We don't want to hear from a man. We want to hear from you. And Lord, I pray that you would speak through me. Uh, and to me as well, Lord, that I would apply these things to my life just like like uh, you're seeking to uh, to uh, to apply them in the lives of the people that are listening to it. And so, Father, we ask that uh, you would intercede for us, for your servant, that your word would go forth with power, that your Holy Spirit would open our ears and give us understanding beyond the limited understanding that we have as humans, but that your Holy Spirit would intercede and give real insight even uh, beyond uh, what the, the speaker is speaking, that you would bring words and verses to mind, uh, to the hearts and lives of each individual here. Lord, you know every heart, you know every individual, uh, you know what we need, and we need, you know what we need to hear, and we, you know what we need to be challenged with. And so we ask, uh, Lord God, that you would take control of these services, move in the lives of your people, reveal yourself to us, Lord, we need you. We need you desperately, and we love you, and want to know you, and want to draw close to you. And so we pray that you would speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. And so we see this idea of a theme. And so the, the theme that I was, I'm looking at, I'm actually still in the Old Testament. So I'm, I'm reading the Bible chronologically this time. And then I'm in like his, Hezekiah's lifetime. 
And so it's a very interesting how Hezekiah himself uh, is moved into a position of desperate need. Uh, if you look at Hezekiah's life, the Assyrians are like, are taking over the northern kingdom. And so this is, this is also the same time of Isaiah and uh, I think Micah as well. So these, so I'm reading kind of all over the place. I'm reading Micah, I'm reading Isaiah, I'm reading Kings, I'm reading Chronicles. And I, it, it kind of gives you a picture of what's actually going on. So the northern kingdom is being taken over by the Assyrians, but they're also moving into the southern kingdom. And Hezekiah is a king, and he's actually a, a, a good king. He begins to uh, to um, uh, 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 a big reformation period. And so he begins to kind of coalesce the, 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 the worship of Jehovah that's being done in the high places, and he's making people come to Jerusalem, specifically the temple, to worship. And so he, he establishes a lot of reforms. And then the Assyrian king comes, and when he first comes, uh, he uh, all um, his, what Hezekiah does is he gives him a bunch of gold and says, "Here is a bunch of gold." And he goes away for a while, but then he comes back, and then this time now he's already basically decimated the northern kingdom, and he's about to do that to to the south. And now Hezekiah realizes that there's no way to appease this king, and so what happens is that he begin he begins to pray to God, and when he begins to pray to God, God begins to act, and Isaiah responds. And he speaks for the Lord. It's, it's an incredible story if you guys want to go through it. But but just the idea that and, and what I got from that was that God puts us in places of desperate need so that we can look to him. You know, when we can kind of maneuver and, and make things happen in our own strength and our own ability, sometimes it works. But for the most part, we need to be placed in a position of dependence upon God. And sometimes it takes a desperate time like what uh, uh, Hezekiah was going through. But again, God works through this man, Hezekiah, who humbles himself, looks to God, and then God, if you know the story, God delivers them. There's an army outside their camp, and God decimates that army. He destroys a whole bunch of people. He kills everyone, and the Assyrians are kind of moved out. And so it's an incredible story. And so, but there, there you see a man humbling himself before God. He's the leader of the people. And because he did, he does so, God responds through Isaiah and, uh, and delivers them and he protects them. And so it's this man's uh, humility and his prayer, ultimately, it's a beautiful prayer too, that causes uh, the, the Jerusalem basically to be delivered. <clears throat> And so it is that theme repeated over and over again in the Bible of how God uses men. And I have a few examples. <clears throat> Be the young or old, all he needs is our obedience. That's all he, he asks. He can do incredible things through us if we have his obedience. Let me turn this on. Sorry. Uh, and so the idea is that our obedience is basically what he's looking for to do great things. So God, through the Bible, speaks to all mankind, but he speaks directly to two men. Uh, first example is Adam, right? He speaks uh, to, man, to man, and he causes him to name these animals. He's basically the author and, and the, the one that's in control of these, these uh, beings. He names them because they're, they're given to him for authority. He's, he's their authority. And then he creates Eve, but he's her authority. And then ultimately, he through him, he says to him, be fruitful and multiply. And so he is the leader of this, this, new, uh, this new entity that he created, which is called the family. And through that, they're supposed to subdue the earth and they're supposed to uh, bring about you know, God's control through them. And so he, the, the man and the, and the woman, but the man specifically is the one that is given that, that leadership role. <clears throat> and then to Noah, right? Noah is the one that God speaks to. To build this ark to deliver the that that family over the flood and so um preserving mankind from the flood and that continuing the the work of 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 god in that line that ultimately would be that promised messiah that was promised there in uh i think it's genesis 3 15. that that one that would uh, uh crush the serpent's head <clears throat> and so to abraham right now, Abraham is the one that is, establishes the uh, 
the Jewish nation, right? That would the nation that would be called Israel, and through that nation would be the Messiah. <clears throat> and much more than the Messiah, we have the Word of God, right? The, the Old Testament. We have the 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 uh, prophets. We have the law of God. So many different things that God uses, and most of these. Uh, people that were writing these uh, scriptures were men. God spoke to these men specifically. And so, and ultimately to our Messiah, to Jesus, who fulfilled the will of the Father. Uh, he purchased our redemption at the cross, right? He established what we know today as the church. It was Jesus. And he chose 12 men specifically uh, to uh, continue that work. He prepared them. He spent uh, time with them. He poured his life into them for three years. He taught them, and then he filled them with the Spirit of God uh, later on, and there in Acts chapter 2, and then they went out and did the same thing. I believe that, that that's the, the picture that we have of discipleship. And so it's, it's men uh, being used by God. And of course, there's women being used by God, absolutely. But God's main purpose and his main plan, just like the Father is, a, is the authority. The Son does the will of the Father, and the Holy Spirit fulfills that uh, by empowering believers, right? Every part of the Godhead has a role. And so we as believers have to have that same kind of order. But why? Well, well let, let's look at these verses, and we'll kind of uh, touch on that, on that, that, uh, that reason why. And so let's go to verse 12. <clears throat> And so here, uh, let me just read. Let me just read the whole, uh, the three, the three verses, and then we'll go on. And he says, "I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you, for His name's sake." Thirteen. I write unto you, fathers, because ye have known Him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because ye have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because ye have known the Father. And then 14, and I have written unto you fathers because you have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you young men because you're strong and the word of God abideth in you and you have overcome the wicked one. And then it goes on, you know, uh, calling uh, people not to love the world, to focus on Christ uh, and to uh, reject Satan. And so many other teachings talks about God's love. But I want to focus on these verses specifically. And so verse 12 establishes his larger audience, right? He's talking to children. Children, we all come to, to Christ in the same uh, way. We're all his children. You know, I uh, heard it said, and uh, God doesn't have any grandchildren. Every one of us has to accept Christ as Savior. There is no being fathered into the, the Christian life. We all have to be confronted with our sin, right? We all have to be uh, forgiven of our sins. We all have to claim Jesus as Lord. We all have to be washed in the blood. We all have to uh, uh, be uh, surrendered to God and His will. Claim Jesus as Lord. There is no, there is no way to to uh, to avoid that. That's how we enter into fellowship. That's how we enter into the Christian life, and it's the only way to really receive uh, the Spirit of God. We have to be washed in the blood. And so He's talking to the children, which is basically all believers. But yeah, he, then he adds the focus to the fathers. He goes from children to fathers. And so uh, verse 13, therefore, allowing us to have a relationship with the father, that's 13. And then he focuses on um, fathers. Here John writes to the fathers of the church. He's speaking to the leaders. He's speaking to those that are that are supposed to be in authority. You have to remember, in the uh, one of the things I realized in the first century uh, church, Everything was kind of adopted from the synagogue uh, mentality or that idea of where you had that minion, right? And so it was the men that were always uh, called to, to sing. They were called to preach. They were called to speak. They were called to read. And so they were called to lead. And so that, that was uh, something that was adopted by Paul. And I believe it was adopted by the, the first century church as well. And so the men themselves are the ones that are supposed to be leading uh, that 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 movement, that church, and Jesus Himself, you know, like I said, chose twelve disciples specifically. Now He had women, you know, helping. There were He taught them, you know, like Mary and others, 
but he expected the men to take that responsibility because that's his ultimate picture back there with when he established the family he established the man to be the the leader and so that in this is something that you know the lord's been kind of dealing with me about in a lot of things and that's why i'm sharing it specifically so like i said here john writes to the fathers of the church and and so what is he saying he says men who like enoch of old know the eternal father and let me just read that verse i write unto you fathers because you have known him that is from the beginning and so the idea is that it's, it's not necessarily a, a knowledge of knowing about god or knowing god in a sense but knowing god in an experiential way knowing him through experience this is uh, not an intellectual knowledge so men would walk will, and uh, one of the things that i see is that men with that walk with god will be leaders because that's what god is looking to develop in uh, those that are following him, uh, specifically the men. And so it, 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 they'll be leaders. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that I'm reminded of that when, I, when I was, think, uh, when I was uh, praying about this is Genesis 18, 19 in reference to leadership. And I just want to uh, read it there real quick. It's, uh, it's what uh, God says about um, Abraham specifically. This is uh, he's about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, and he's actually going to talk to uh, Abraham about it. It's an interesting story. And as he's, he's about to talk to Abraham about it, he's kind of discussing within the Godhead, if you will, within these three men that were and uh, of if he should, you know, uh, uh, speak to to um, to Abraham about it. And this is the reason why he gives that allows that that. That, that he gives that he will speak with him and he says uh let me just read it from 17. and the lord said this is uh genesis 18 uh, 17 through 19. so and the lord said shall i hide from abraham that thing which i do seeing that abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed by him in verse 19 for i know him that he will command his children and his household after him and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of of him. And what he's talking about is the promise to bless them that bless him and curse them that curse him. And in him shall all the families of the earth will be blessed. But the idea that he knew this man's character and the character of this man, because why did he know this man? Because God was developing Abraham's life. As I said before, one of the themes that that I had seen in, in there, and especially in the Old Testament, is how God develops men to do his work. He, he Sometimes he grabs men like Abraham, who are liars, who are cheaters, who are even idolaters, and he develops their character so that he can use them. And so, and that's the picture of discipleship. God can take anyone that's willing to submit themselves to his authority, to God's authority, and he can uh, lead them uh, into a, in, into a, into his will, into what he wants them to do, into a great, you know, to make them great. Uh, I had said this before. It's, it's interesting that that in chapter 11 of, uh, I think it's chapter 11 of Genesis, the men that are building this, um, this ziggurat or this, uh, this building to get to heaven, they're trying to make a name for themselves. And yet God is the only one that that and Abraham is the only man that's remembered because God said, I will make your name great. And so it's the idea that God is the one that developed Abraham's character to do be able to do these things, to be able to, to maintain that Hebrew culture that ultimately would uh, become, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the Israel, Israel, Israel of, of that time. Even to this day, the Jewish people of today. Uh, they're, they're distinct and separate, really, from other people. And so that's the idea that God is developing leadership qualities in men that are willing to submit themselves uh, to him. They'll be disciple makers. Uh, one of the things that I, uh, reminded me when I was thinking about disciple makers is Moses. Uh, Moses discipled Joshua. Uh, but even then, even before that, you know, Moses was overwhelmed uh, at one time in his... Uh, Father-in-law Jethro told him, "Listen, you're gonna you're gonna wear yourself out." And he says, "You you have to you know 
you have to get other people involved. And so the idea was that, okay, we're, you're going to set up, uh, God gives him this, uh, this, uh, uh, the plan to set up these 70 elders, not, uh, and ultimately, eventually it's called the Sanhedrin, but set up these 70 elders to help him. And God says that he's going to pour his spirit upon them, the same spirit that Moses had. He's going to pour his spirit upon them so they could have wisdom to be able to lead. And he does that. And Joshua, when uh, there's a few men that are not part of the 70, but they were all they were listed in the 70 and they begin to prophesy. And Joshua hears about it. He tells he tells Moses, Moses, stop. Don't allow them to prophesy. And it's 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 a wonderful statement that Moses says. He says, are you jealous for me? <laughs> you think that I'm the, I want to keep the Holy Spirit to myself? He says, I don't only wish that these 70 men would prophesy, but that God would, would pour his spirit upon all his people. That's an incredible statement. But that's, that's, that's the heart of a discipler. That's the heart of a man that would seek to uh, fellowship with God, but also want others to have that same kind of fellowship. That, that's the heart of a disciple maker. And so that's that's what God is developing in people's lives. They will have a vision for the future work of God. A uh, David is uh, the 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 one that I think of when I see that, but many others. But the uh, Joseph uh, also, because uh, Joseph himself, he was given a vision as a child that he would be, you know, in high places. He would have even his family and his his uh, his parents bowing before him. God gave him that vision as a child, and that, but that, that's that's what God gives. When you begin to read the scriptures, you begin to look at uh, what God is doing in people's lives, what God has done in the past. God gives you a vision for not only for your family, for your children, but for generations to come. And so that's 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 how God works. God opens up our minds and hearts to 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 things that that are way beyond us. And I was thinking about that. I had a discussion with uh, Gene and Ted in reference to the, the future of Bethel Baptist. And it's something that, that uh, you know, it, it, it I've been praying about for a long time. But the idea is that God is the one that's in control and God is the one that's going to establish it. And as he as we continue this work, he wants uh, Bethel to stay here. He's going to continue to provide the men to uh, to continue to lead it. And uh, it's just it's something that God is always seeking to give us a vision for the future. You know, we, if uh, and one of the things I was praying about that this morning, I think I, I prayed about it with uh, the people here that that Beth, uh, one of my my prayer is that Bethel will last until Jesus returns, that there will be a, a, a presence of of God, of this church uh, to uh, to be used by God to continue uh, the, the gospel uh, until he returns. That's a vision for the future. That's a vision for generations to come. God, Jesus could come back tomorrow. He can come back 100 years from now. But the work of God should continue, and it must continue. And that's it's a vision that we should have for the future beyond me, you know, beyond our children, if uh, the Lord tarries. And that's 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 what God gives us. And then, and then finally, uh, men of God will be led by the Holy Spirit. Right? Ultimately, he is the authority. He is the one that, that leads uh, in the book of Acts, right? The uh, book of Acts is really the acts of the Holy Spirit. It, it, it's amazing to me in the book of Acts how the Holy Spirit is so clear and clearly guiding and directing uh, the, um, the, uh, the disciples, Cornelius and others. It's just uh, it's, it's so incredible. Uh, I remember um, I was thinking about that, and I think I have mentioned it as well. How there's uh, there's decisions made uh, before the Holy Spirit and after. Uh, before the Holy Spirit, they decide uh, on uh, who will be the twelfth disciple, and uh, there's no real direction. Or they have to actually cast lots. But after the Holy Spirit is poured out, there is no question of what direction God is giving them. They they really have clear. Uh, direction from God and from the Holy Spirit. There is no casting lots. There's no, you know, guessing. It's the God through His Holy Spirit clearly leading the church from uh, Acts two and on. There is no question about that. And I believe that we can have that same uh, kind of clarity in our direction as in this church, 
if we as a, as a church are looking to the Holy Spirit, because God knows what's going to happen. He's going to have knows what's going to excuse me what's going to happen next week. He knows what's going to happen next month, at the end of this year. We have plans for the work of God, but God knows you know what's going to actually happen, and He can prepare us for any any you know eventuality, any any issue, any problem, any disaster if we're looking to Him uh, to guide us and to direct us. Out. Reminded there in Acts when they had a famine, and uh, and the Lord through a Paul was able to bring uh, money to the church there in Jerusalem, you know. So God provided even in that famine to the church. And so it's the idea that the Holy Spirit is guiding and directing and directing, and so that's that's a picture of God working in fathers and leadership, and I think that's his his. Uh, his desire, because of the that that picture of of God working through men is something that that brings an example to those around uh, them, uh, uh, people around to fa- in the families in the church, and so it's very important. And then he talks up to uh, young men, and so we we're looking at young men, and he says, "I write unto you, young men." This is verse thir- thirteen, because ye have overcome. The wicked one. And then uh, later on, he also says, I write unto you, <clears throat> young men, because you are strong and the word of God abideth in you and you have overcome the wicked one. And so the, that idea of a young men active in battle, you know, there's, there's a spiritual battle going on. We see it every day. We see the decay in our society. We see the the the, the, the confusion, uh, the the the. Uh, the sin and the wickedness, the things that are going on in, in our lives and even in the lives of our brothers and sisters. And so the idea is that we have to be in battle and the battle really is on our knees. You know, the Bible says that we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. We're wrestling against these principalities, these powers, uh, thrones and dominions, this spiritual wickedness in high places. We have no real uh, uh, power over that except on our knees. You know, there's that sense that prayer is uh, really what uh, impacts uh, the world around us. Going back to Hezekiah, you know, Hezekiah had to be put in a position where he had to go to God and he could only go to God. And my fear is that the, the church of God today, really, we we have so much resources available to us that God is really our last resort. Getting on our knees is really the last thing that we do. You know, we will, you know, we'll plan, we'll we'll have meetings, we'll do all these things. But to get on our knees and to pray and to seek his face and to beg him to move, it's it's probably our last resort. Uh, I'm reminded that we're talking about um, 9-11, what happened 9-11 and and how so many people flooded the churches. You know, it has to come. Does it have to come to that? Does it have to come to something like that for the church? To, to gather together and pray and to really ask the Lord to move uh, in our city, in our nation. And, I, you know, I hope not. But, you know, Hezekiah was put in that position. He was giving, he was had to be surrounded by the enemy and the Assyrians were, were, were ruthless. You know, they were the first ones that began impaling people. And so the idea was that they were going to either destroy them and then they were going to, whoever was left, they were going to, uh, just like they did to the northern kingdom, they were just going to exile them out to, some, to, to somewhere else. And then they'll bring other people to that land. That's what they did to the northern kingdom. So they would divide them and they would separate them all over the world. And so that's, but that's, but that, but uh, the thing is that I don't, I hope that the church of God begins to pray before something like that happens, you know? And so... But this is God's plan for uh, for for uh, His people. He, uh, going back to young men, excuse me. And so that's the idea that the young men supposed they're we're supposed to be reclaiming ground for the Lord, moving the work of God forward, uh, overcoming the wicked, growing in in the in in our faith, right? Developing that that mind of Christ. I think that's something that. As a church, we don't do either. We don't. We're not developing the mind of Christ. We're not immersing ourselves in in the Word of God. And so, 
the idea is that God needs needs to change us, conform us. I, I know it's a prayer that I pray a lot is that God would conform us to the image of Christ. And it's something that's a reality, but really it takes effort. It takes us getting in the word. It takes us submitting to that discipline of studying and reading and seeking after God with our whole heart and then applying it because it's not enough to know a lot about the Bible. If we're not applying it, if it's not impacting us as, as Christians, if we're not seeking to live by it, then it's just words, then it's just knowledge, and it's, it's meaningless. And it, it really builds pride. One of the things that I've seen is people who, who are, the Bible says that that knowledge puffs up, but charity edify it. Our knowledge, too much knowledge and not enough application puffs us up and makes us more focused on what other people aren't doing or should be doing and not necessarily what, what the Lord is speaking to me about. And so like going back, like this is something that, you know, the Lord's been kind of dealing with me for a long time. And, uh, you know, little by little, when, with my hard head, he he's getting through. So, um, but but this is it. This is what we at, are, as his church, as his body, are supposed to be uh, doing, uh, working, moving the work of God forward, going back to overcoming the wicked. How do you do that? Right, we're seated at the right hand of the Father. I know Pastor talks about it, but the Bible says it. You know that that we're seated in heavenly places. Our position in Christ is above the enemy, and so we we have to claim that, and we have to walk and live in that in that authority, authority, the authority that Christ gives us. You know, and uh, and look to Him to guide us how to push the devil back, push Satan back from from these strongholds in our cities, in our nation. And like I said, this is God's plan for his church. As we see the spiritual battle, our, our society's moral decay, uh, that demonic gender confusion that's going on, uh, the, the church of God must be distinct. And that's that's basically what I felt the Holy Spirit and God wanted me to kind of preach about this. I'm like, why am I going to preach about this on a Wednesday night with this hardly any men? But the idea is that this is, this is God's plan. This is how he redeems society. He does it through men. He does it through the orderly running. He's established the family unit and he does it in an orderly fashion. And it's the responsibility of men. And when when the society sees that, regardless of whether they reject it or not, they'll see that God is is righteous and right in doing what he's the way that he set up the family, the way that he sets up our society and our government. So he's the one. Other has has established that we're supposed to follow, you know. So, so now more, uh, any man who submits to the spirit of God and immerses himself in the word of God will be a leader. Why? Because God only develops the best qualities in men. And men were created by God to be leaders. That, that's that's his whole plan. If and not necessarily leaders of a nation or a country, but at least leaders of a family. And even in the church, the men are supposed to be leaders in the church, in the body of Christ. Uh, I believe that that's his, his specific uh, desire and his role. And I think a church thrives and people learn and people grow. Women and men grow when, when men take their rightful position uh, in, of authority. Uh, Paul's statement in chapter 14 of God's men being strong is true. Just like Joshua, th that I that command of the angel to Joshua, be strong and very courageous. It's the same, basically the same uh, thing that I'm seeking uh, to uh, to express right now. The fact that, first of all, it's not even by our own strength, but the idea is that the, the angel spoke to Joshua and he says at, at a crucial time in his life, when he's taking over the leadership of, uh, of Israel and about to go into it, going into the land to, to uh, conquer it, he says, be strong and be very courageous. And this is the call for uh, the men in our church, specifically for me as well, to be strong and to be very courageous. Um, and it says, we must have confidence. And this is my final statement. We must have confidence that it's not by might nor by power, but by his spirit, says the Lord. It's in Zechariah 4, 4 6. Uh, we not we're not supposed to have confidence in ourselves. Every time I come up here, I get I'm nervous. 
as some fear, even though perfect love does cast out fear, this is not my normal, but the Lord always intercedes for me. You know, I understand uh, uh, Diamond, and uh, it, it's it's not easy to perform before people if you're not used to it. So, and uh, it's not a performance, but but the idea is that you know we try to do our best, and sometimes failures failures causes us to uh, you know to get back up again. And uh, I want, just want to encourage Diamond there to uh, continue regardless of uh, any failures. And uh, the Lord definitely can uh, use even somebody like me, even somebody like you, because again, it's not by our own strength. Uh, it's by the, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can empower anyone. Like I said, that's what he's seeking to do. He's developing leadership in men. And when men are leaders, I believe that everyone is blessed. Women are strengthened. Uh, uh, they grow and, uh, and the whole church uh, does, it, it, it uh, becomes an example of uh, Christ to the world. And uh, that's that's something that's very important, especially now as we see this confusion of, you know, who leads a gender confusion, a transgender movement, all of that. We have to be distinct as a church. If we're not distinct as a church, we're just gonna fall in line with whatever the world is is uh is is teaching and preaching and we're gonna fall for the for the devil's lies these are all doctrines of demons we really have to look to the word of god and stay in the word of god not to be deceived 